Good day, everyone, and welcome to Make America Healthy, where our goal is to educate you, empower you, and inspire you with tools so you can take better care of your own physical and mental health. Because at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, you are your own best health advocate on every level. My name is Beth Shaw. I'm the author of four best-selling books on health and wellness, the founder of Yoga Fit Training Systems, the world's largest yoga mind body school, celebrating over 26 years of educating people worldwide on how to take better care of their bodies, their minds, and their spirits. And I'm also the host of this podcast, Make America Healthy. So we've got a very interesting topic that we can all relate to today, and that is the topic of grief. And the title of today's show is, Is Your Grief Making You Sick? Because many times it can make you sick. And we've got two experts today to talk about that and also give us some practical solutions so we can better deal with something we as humans all have to deal with, which is grief. We all experience loss, death. It's a natural part of being a human being, but it doesn't sit well with a lot of us. And sometimes it can really be not only making you sick, but perhaps killing you. So I'd like to introduce our guests today, both our repeat guests to Make America Healthy. We've got Stan Goldberg back, and he has recently written a book called Preventing Senior Moments, and he'll introduce himself a little bit more. And we have Yoga Fit trainer extraordinaire, Jen Tarrant, who also wrote the Yoga Fit program that is so very popular right now. And it is a one-day program called Yoga for Grief. And again, welcome to both of my guests. So this is a topic that everybody can relate to. It's something we all have to deal with. And oftentimes we're not prepared to deal with it. Even if we have a therapist, a coach, a counselor, we're challenged. And let's talk a little bit about it. Let's dive right into it. Jen, I'd like to start with you because this is a topic that's been very fresh for us at Yoga Fit Training Systems for the past year and a half now, as we worked on the Yoga for Grief program. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, grief in a macro sense, and, and then we'll talk to Stan a little bit, and then we'll get into some solutions to what to do if you're listening to this show and you are in fact grieving something. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Beth. And thanks for inviting me back. Always fun to spend a little time together exploring yoga and wellness together. The Yoga for Grief and Loss program that you mentioned has been really popular. It's been out for a little over a year now. And in this training, we really explore grief on that big level to start. We talk about what is grief and it is our natural response to loss. And then we take a little bit of a deeper look into what does that mean then? How does that affect us on all of our in all of our bodies and all of our koshas, our mental, our physical, our emotional, our intellectual, energetic body, how does that grief affect us in all of the ways? And that's one of the things that I find to be really helpful is how we begin to understand how that grief begins to affect us on all of those different parts of ourself. Wonderful. Hi, Stan. Welcome back to well, you Make you America Healthy. Tell our listeners a little bit more about you. I believe you're a mental health professional and tell us your take on grief. My training is in the area of speech language pathology. And that's where I got my doctorate. And for 30 years, I worked at San Francisco State University where I specialized in a few kinds of disorders such as stuttering language disorders and also did a lot of counseling. I stayed at the university until for health reasons, I had to retire, and that was an issue of loss and grief for me, but that we can hold off on that. And what I did from there was I became a bedside hospice volunteer. I did that for eight years, and I allowed the people that I served to teach me about grief. And with that, I started applying those lessons in various situations. I think my concept my notion of what grief is and how to treat it is based on those experiences and quite often puts me at loggerheads with the psychological community. Can you elaborate on that? Because I love when there's a controversy. We've had a lot of controversy on Make America Healthy. And when someone is uh, a radical visionary, an out-of-the-box thinker, 
uh, comes up with concepts and ideas that don't necessarily go with the standard operating procedures of an industry, I find it fascinating. Give us both sides of that fence. I would probably call myself a radical in the 1960s with the civil rights movement. Whether I consider myself a a thought leader or I'm not sure what some of the other terms, I'll, I'll leave that for others to decide. But if you look at historically how counselors and psychologists treated grief, most relied upon talk therapy. You sat down with a counselor and you tried to talk out some of the problems that you had, some of the losses. And if you had enough money and if you had enough time, you could get over your grief. Unfortunately, the people that I dealt with had neither. In a hospice, we measure time there by weeks. And most of the people that I worked with were indigent. So Mm -hmm. it became interesting on what, how I was going to formulate what I thought would be more effective. And at that same time, I was having some some physical problems that resulted in me not doing an activity that defined myself, which was fly fishing in the wilderness. So the summary of all it is, if you look at loss, what loss really is, it's the loss not of a specific person, ability, object, or relationship. It's the loss of the emotion that generated any of those things. So what it resulted in is when I counseled people, we talked about not finding another husband to replace one that died, but rather finding an activity that could generate the same type of emotions that your husband did. So that's not necessarily a position held by many psychologists, but it's the one that that I found to be most helpful when people are tired of the notion of give time, give your grief time to heal because they don't have time for that. That's basically in a nutshell what it is. And then the way in which you address grief is based on your understanding of what it is and how it's related to emotions. So what I'm hearing from you, Stan, is that you encouraged people who were indigent. So perhaps you were speaking more in a language of emotions than intellect. Yeah, I wouldn't frame it quite that way. I I think I've counseled people who are indigent and also those who are CEOs of major corporations. And it applies equally to both. The idea is, why do we grieve? We grieve a loss that was important to our identity or that serves a certain emotional function. If a husband grieves the loss of his wife to the point where he can't do anything else, then you need to ask What is the relationship that they had? And why was that relationship so important to his identity? Once you identify that, then you can start looking at the emotion that is no longer being expressed. And once you do that, you're then in a position to look for something that could replace it. A person that I counseled who was a CEO of a major corporation And he retired, he had to retire because he had a stroke. And for him, he could never again manage money the way he was responsible for in the corporation. But he could contribute in other ways. And he found that by volunteering at a local boys club, he was able to satisfy that emotion he no longer felt because of the stroke and the retirement. So what I'm hearing from you, Stan, is that uh, grief is a little bit more of, I don't want to, I need to find a better word for this, but more of an ego-based. I I wouldn't call it ego-based. I would call it as part of your identity. Part of your identity. And so when part of our identity goes missing, we suffer a loss. Correct. And then let's both, I'd like either one of you to jump in on this. Can we really get over our grief or we, or much like trauma? And I wrote a book called Healing Trauma with Yoga, where we talked about PTSD, trauma, depression, anxiety, or if you can't really get over grief, you you just learn to better manage and mitigate the daily symptoms. Jen, why don't you share a little bit about this? Because I know the Yoga for Grief program talks a lot about this. Definitely. In, In that program, we talk quite a bit about how it's not a getting over. It's not all of a sudden there's one day where you can snap your fingers and it's gone, but instead learning to integrate 
your life as it is now. And that will maybe always have those memories or those things come up where you have that moment of either sadness of missing someone or a moment of joy in remembering a wonderful moment or even simply a, a sentimental or nostalgic time. Um, but we're able to integrate that so that we don't find that our experience of our grief is running our life and calling all the shots, but it becomes more integrated and just part of the fabric of the rest of our life. Wonderful. And I know they say there are stages of grief. I, you know, Jen, perhaps you could share what they are and then remind our listeners that much like waves in the beach, those stages, you can jump from one to another and then back to another. And it, it's not a linear path. Would you agree with that statement? Definitely. In fact, I was just in a little workshop with David Kessler, who co-wrote a book with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who developed those, or know, she had developed them, but identified those five stages of grief. And just to re-familiarize everyone, they are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And David has identified a sixth stage, and that's finding meaning. And that typically happens most of, like you said, they're not linear. We can jump back and forth. We may linger in one. We may skip over one. But that finding meaning stage, when it does happen for us, does tend to happen a little later. We probably all know of a story of someone who lost someone and created a foundation or set up a scholarship in their name and created some meaning in that way to carry that person's legacy forward. And sometimes it is big like that. And other times it's really small things like, oh, well, now I enjoy an activity that I do in honor of the person that I've lost, but it's created a new meaning in my own life, a time to be reflective, a time to step into that reverence of meeting our grief where it is. Wonderful. Stan, you had mentioned that a lot of loss and feelings of despair around grief have to do with how that individual or job pet made you feel. Where does love factor into all of this? You know, I have a dog that's going to be 13 in March. I rescued him 12 years ago. And I know that and he's with me like pretty much 24 seven. I know that when he passes, I'm going to suffer a, an incredible loss and grieve. And yes, how he makes me feel and, and maybe part of my identity, but also just the missing, the absence of a soul that existed that has now transitioned to the other side. Where does that fit in with all of your uh thought process on grief being a lot about uh, self-identity? It's a great question. I wrote an article for Psychology Today a few months ago where I talked about there not being any hierarchies of grief, that essentially grief is grief. If you suffer a loss, it doesn't make a difference what the loss is. It's, if it's significant, then it's important. And I think I probably had at least 200 responses chastising me for equating the loss of a pet or the ability to knit with the loss of a husband for 50 years. I think that it's a misconception people have that you can't grieve equally as deeply for the loss of a specific skill or an animal as you can for a husband. The importance of grief, as you said, is does it serve of, of a, is it part of someone's identity? Is does it generate a certain emotion such as love? Is it something that gives you immense pleasure? And if you think of just those terms, then it doesn't make a difference what the loss was. They're all equal. I 100% agree with you, Stan. It's much if someone's suffering some type of pain, there is no measuring stick that one's person, one person's pain is, is less or greater than another. It's all such an individual perception and experience. And, and also we can be affected by things very differently as we are all individual. And, and sometimes 
people and experiences and pets, they can get in there rather quickly. And we form attachments that other people simply can't understand and definitely shouldn't judge. Mm -hmm. I agree. Jen, let's uh, talk a little bit about dealing with grief. And I, both of you can answer this. Is your grief killing you? Is your grief making you sick? We often hear that couples who have been married for 50, 60 years, when one passes, the other one passes within months. Is there some scientific phenomena behind it? Any new data, any new research that our listeners should know about? Yes, I'm looking, I was actually, while you were framing the question, looking for the exact study, and I'm having a hard time putting my fingers on it, but there is a study that shows the um, biological and energetic loop that we form, particularly with people we live in the same house with, or pets. So we have this feedback loop with our spouse, with our child, with our pet, with anyone who lives with us. And when one of those people dies and is removed from the home, the energetic loop is disturbed. And so our body's used to getting this feedback and all of a sudden it's not there. And so there is definitely this like almost learning to walk on your own without assistance or something where your body has to learn how to find that regulation again without the feedback that's happening. And that can be one of the things that really causes a lot of the physical sensations that that accompany our grief or symptoms or the things that we would say are making us feel sick. Wonderful. Thank you. Stan, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I, I was thinking as you as Jen was talking about it, I, I can remember two studies and I don't have the exact references. But one I believe was an NIH study where they compared the lifespan of people who were widowed and who were widowers and people who were still together. And there was a significant difference. And it could have been, I don't know, it was something like three to five or six years difference. If you stay with a spouse, whether it's for good reasons or not, you'll end up living longer than if they're not there. So that was the one study. There was another study that was more an indirect study, but I think it's very applicable. There were two researchers, I think, in the early 2000s that wanted to take a look neurologically what happens with negative thoughts. And what they were able to show is that when you have one negative thought, it tends to link to others and it just keeps linking. So even though you may have had, you may have been thinking just one thing that was not very positive, it generated into many others. And what I've been looking at is the lifespan of people who are negative thinkers and those who are positive. And I really haven't seen any convincing data, but I would love to see a study about that. Yeah, I guess that would require a lot of self-reporting for people to yeah. write down all of their thoughts and then mm -hmm. someone to ascertain whether or not they're actually negative thoughts or positive thoughts. Mm -hmm. But we all know that our brain, it goes five times the negative to one the positive so that mm -hmm. we really need to become, and we teach a lot of that at Yoga Fit, to become the witness to your thoughts and then shift your thoughts because your thoughts create emotion and then emotion will create an action or a reaction. And it's either going to be an upward spiral or a downward spiral. And positive self-talk goes a long way. Jen, in our Yoga Fit for Grief program, where does self-talk enter into all of this? So what we do is we start exploring how to create affirmations that lead us where we want to go while still acknowledging where we are. One of the things we study about our affirmations is if we just say, oh, I'm totally happy, I'm going to have a great day. Well, that may be way too big of a leap for someone right in the middle of grief. And so instead of creating this lofty high ideal that may be completely unattainable in the moment to say... I'm going to create one moment today where I feel some joy or an enjoyment. Maybe I'll create for myself a nice herbal tea, or I'll take a walk around the block and see how many flowers I notice, or schedule some time to chat with a friend on the phone, something of that nature that's really small. And so in that affirmation saying, today I choose to create one moment of joy, or I'm supporting myself in my grief. 
And that can look like a lot of things that can look like going to yoga class that can look like gardening that can look like maybe petting the neighbor's dog. It can look like so many different things, but the affirmations we create around these experiences are things that acknowledge where we are and perpetuate us forward. Wonderful. And let's talk a little bit about guilt because I was teaching one of my online yoga lean classes recently, and we had one of our members just lost her mom and she came to the class and she said, I just needed to breathe and feel for an hour. Sometimes people feel guilty about enjoying life once particularly a a spouse or a parent or a child has passed. How do we weave in and deal with uh, guilt, which we know on the energetic scale of emotions is pretty close to the bottom? Uh, How do we deal with guilt as it relates to grief? About 40 years ago, when my marriage and family were going down the toilet, I decided it was time for a break. And I decided to do a retreat at a place called the Shasta Buddhist Abbey here in California. And I thought, you know, that was going to be the place that I'm going to get rid of the grief of being a failed father, get rid of the guilt for not doing what I had hoped that I could do, and maybe reestablishing my life again. So the first day there, the abbot came out, and there's you know, lots of participants, and he asked, is there anybody that would like to have individual counseling? And I, my hand immediately went up. I said, yes, definitely. So I probably was in my 40s at that time. And so I went into the room, and in comes a monk. And I don't think he was 20. At least I don't think he even started to shave yet. And I was going to spill my guts to this person who the closest he probably ever came to to having a family was something he read in a comic book. So I was very dismissive about it. And But very soon, shortly after, I would say maybe 10, 15 minutes, I forgot all my defenses and I laid out everything to him. The end of this half hour session, he was told it was dead quiet. And we started to rock a little bit. And he said, Stan, we do the best we can given the circumstances of our life. And he got up and he walked out. And I thought, that's it? And it took me a while to realize that was it. And that was, I think, the best advice that I ever got from anybody. That if we go about accumulating guilt without taking into consideration everything that led up to that. We do ourselves and others a disservice. So yeah, guilt is something I try to avoid. And whenever I get to the point where I'm starting to slip, I think about that young monk who hadn't begun to shave. Thank you very much. (laughs) That's a great story. Let's get into some coping skills for grief, if we can just bullet point them for our listeners. And and again, um, we've all done our fair share of grieving in the past four years uh, due to the pandemic. Um, it could be loss of uh, employment. It could be uh, changes in location, uh, life as it used to be. If you're younger and you missed your college graduation, everybody's had something to grieve. Uh, what are some practical steps to deal with grief? Jen, would you like to start? Sure. Exactly. We've all had losses. Absolutely. And I find that because of the way culturally we approach the the duration of grief or the expression of grief, it feels very contained to most of us. We're kind of allowed, if you will, a week or maybe two to experience and express our grief, our sadness, our sense of loss. And then we either expect ourselves or find pressure from the outside to start returning to whatever normal is supposed to be now. Our expressions of grief are often limited to being able to openly cry and express that for a few days, certainly at a memorial service. And then beyond that, maybe we find people around us getting really uncomfortable with the 
prolonged nature of some of our expressions of grief. And in my work with different clients and groups, some of the things I have found to be the most powerful is the acknowledgement and expression of those emotions that we feel have been sort of caged or boxed in or pushed to the side. And so doing things like big breath work with arm movements for the listeners who are familiar with a breath of joy or a windmill breath where the arms reach way overhead with the inhale and come down to our sides in a robust way with our exhales. Those can be really helpful, but even things that get a little deeper at those tough emotions so often as a response in our grief, we feel really angry. Maybe that anger is at the person who's gone. Maybe it's at ourself for not doing or doing something that we feel like could have been different. It could go a hundred different ways, what we may be angry about, but we often don't feel the freedom to express that. But if we take like a yoga for grief class, or we have a yoga for grief session, we can do some really big vocal body movement breath combinations that allow us to get those big emotions out, to yell out, to cry out, to dance it out. I know that's one of your favorites, but yeah. to get those big feelings out of our body, because one of the things that we do know is the way out is through. It's not pushing it aside. It's not burying it. It's not sticking it in a box. It's actually acknowledging, experiencing, expressing so that then we're able to continue that forward movement into that integration. Wonderful. And I have a question about compartmentalization. Some of us are better at it than others. I know you said, Jen, don't put our grief in a box, mm -hmm. but I have found uh, in my personal experience that in dealing with challenging situations, whether it's in my personal life or around work or life in general, sometimes just putting those things in a box, putting them up on a shelf and then pulling them down when the time is appropriate helps with the continuity of the rest of my life so that I'm not swimming in it 24 seven. What are your, what are both of your thoughts on compartmentalizing as it relates to grief? I had a very good friend of mine whose son was murdered when he was, I think, 21, 22, he was her soulmate, you know, and I loved both of them. And they both were very important parts of my life. When I asked my friend, had, does she ever get over the grief? And her response was, no, it just takes different forms. So I found that it's very difficult to, to compartmentalize grief. The grief that I felt when I no longer could do a favorite activity didn't go away, and I wasn't able to box it up. It seeped through in almost everything else I was doing. So I, my hat goes off to anybody who can compartmentalize grief. That's something I can't do, and most of my clients are, were unable to do. Great. Stan, thank you so much. Jen, what are your thoughts? I think one of the things that you said was to save it for later is a real key because they're at the beginning, are we able to comp compartmentalize it? Not really. It is where it is. It's so present. It's so big. But as we continue forward and maybe it's been a few weeks, months, or a couple of years even, and we feel it's starting to well up and we're in the middle of the grocery or we're giving a talk. I know you give lots of presentations and things. Well, that's not going to be a time where you probably feel like, you know what, I'm just going to stop my talk right now and I'm going to have my moment of grief. You're probably going to compartmentalize it in that moment, or maybe we're at the store and we feel like this is not the place where I need to fall apart. And so we do put it in that box, but I think the key there is to save for later and to not ignore opening that box. Right, right. So we need to make time for our emotions exactly, without perhaps being run by them. Yes. There's a quote from a lovely little book called Balloon in a Box by Tom Rose. And one of the quotes from that book I really love is he says he'd lost his wife and he said, Oh, I read that. I might've sent you that book. I think you did. Yeah. <laughs> he says each morning when I get up, I decide how I will manage my grief today. But that's that creation of that time. Is it going to be a movement class later? Is it going to be a walk with the dog? Is it going to be a chat with a friend? But where are going to be the places where I acknowledge and express my grief? 
Wonderful. Jen, tell us a little bit about the Yoga for Grief program, where we can find you. I think you're going to be presenting it in Scottsdale at the Mind Body Fitness Conference. Yes, at in Scottsdale, also in Orlando in, I believe that's September. September, that right? yeah. Yes. And then also we're offering it online several times this year, which you can find at yogafit.com. It's Yoga for Grief and Loss. It's a two-day program, whether that's online. Oh, or it's a two-day program now. It is. It okay. is a two-day program. And we we really explore all of the things from what is grief starting at the very beginning. We get into that, how it affects our body. And then we start to explore the philosophy on how we deal with grief. We talk about those affirmations you brought up. We do a lot with breath, body and movement as well as meditation and come up with some really practical, helpful ways that are encapsulated either in a traditional like hour time frame, but also we do quite a few things that fit into five to 15 minutes, things that are really easy easy to do for our students, our clients, and ourselves in the moment when we really need it. Yeah. So important to have those little moments where you can give yourself a break and and do a little positive self-talk or do a few activities. And you can actually change your mind-body state in a very short period of time, especially with movement and breath work. It's, it's really it's always amazing to me, even after teaching for a, and going on uh, 30 years now how you can make a complete body mind shift in a very short period of time if it's done with intention and and not even enthusiasm sometimes. I I remember so many times in my life when I was suffering with something and I would just make myself go for a walk or go to yoga or to do some breath work, some positive affirmations, and it does create a shift. One thing I'd like to touch on before we part ways today is A lot of times and people can get almost addicted to a negative thought process, a negative loop, or just feeling bad. I myself have been in those periods of time. And then when that passes, it's like a big weighted blanket has lifted off of you. But we sometimes will ruminate to the point, and this is back to the topic of the show, is your grief making you sick or is your grief killing you? We will ruminate to the point where it becomes like our neural pathways then become conditioned with that. And it always becomes an addiction, much like an addiction to nicotine or sugar or something even stronger. How do we break those cycles and how do we recognize that we're in that downward spiral? Many years ago, the Vietnamese monk Thich Nhat Hanh was asked about Western psychotherapy. And he said he never understood that with all of the wonderful things we have here in the West and the abundance of everything, how we're so fixated on things that are negative. To him, it didn't make any sense. Neurologically, it also doesn't make any sense. Again, and this was that study that was done in the the early 2000s, if the more you focus on things that are negative, the more likely it's going to be duplicated and becomes more entrenched. In the in my book, the Preventing Senior Moments, I talk about what things can be done in order to change many of the negative things in our life. And there are uh, a number of things that can make life more positive in very easy ways. Thank you, Stan. I would love to, if you can uh, get a chance to send me that study, I would love to read it. And I'd like to put it in our show notes so our listeners can read it as well. Because I think that's a problem that is pervasive in our society right now. And until train more people how to become aware of their own thoughts, people will just become the victim of their own thoughts, the conditioning of the media, of outside forces that don't contribute to keeping a positive mindset. And I'd like to share with our listeners, keeping a positive mindset, whether you're suffering with grief, depression, trauma, anxiety, it's work. It's a lot of work. I myself have had a tendency towards depression as long as I can remember a horrible PMS, which two weeks out of the month, that's a wild uh, mental and emotional roller coaster. So I've had to develop a lot of coping skills. And during the pandemic, as I was my own mental health practitioner without any medication, I've developed a lot more. It is work. It can be done. It's worth it. And I will also share just going out for a very brisk walk or some running, some cardio, obviously yoga. 
will really create a positive shift for you just from a biochemical standpoint. So sometimes that first push to get yourself out the door is the most challenging one, but just know that you can create a positive mindset with positive thought, with witnessing your own thoughts, with facing and replacing them, positive affirmations. And then many of the tools that we teach you at the Yoga for Grief program. Stan, tell our listeners where we can find your new book and where we can find you. The new book, again, is called Preventing Senior Moments, How to Stay Alert into Your 90s and Beyond. You can get it at any of the online booksellers and at any of the brick and mortar stores. I also have a website, Stan Goldberg, W-R-I-T-E-R dot com. And on that website, I have over 200 articles that I've written that cover the range of topics that we've actually talked about today. I also started writing for Psychology Today online, and there will usually be two new articles a month. And I'm just finishing up a novel on many of the topics we talked about today that hopefully will come out sometime in the next year or so. Wonderful. I look forward to meeting you when I'm in the Bay Area next. I'd like to get your book for my mother, actually, who's having some cognitive dysfunction now. And Jen, tell our listeners where we can find you. Of course. I'm on most of the social channels at Jen Tarrant Yoga, J-E-N-N-T-A-R-R-A-N-T Yoga, and uh, also jentarrant.com. And of course, you can always find me hanging around doing trainings for Yoga Fit and exploring ways we can bring the benefits of yoga, breath, body movement to support whatever life brings our way. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for being on the show. Before we say goodbye to you, we'd like to thank the sponsors of this show, Life Boost Coffee, clean, mold-free, no pesticides, shade grown. They pay their farmers an equitable wage. You can check out lifeboostcoffee.com. Check out their new mindfulness blend. I actually developed it. It's a half-calf blend of a dark roast coffee. So it will give you energy, but not get you too jacked up. And you can save 15% at checkout at lifeboostcoffee.com by using the code YOGAFIT. Also, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Blush Love. You can check them out at blushlove or blushvibes.com. They make a whole bunch of adult programs and products and design for all bodies. And you can get some Kegel balls for your yoga practice and a whole bunch of other stuff. So check out blushlove.com. You can also save 15% at checkout, I think 16% now by using the code YOGAFIT blushlove.com, blushvibes.com. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, Erconia Lasers. They specialize in high-level infrared red light lasers. I use one on my dog. They're great for scar tissue. They're great for inflammation, for pain, for calm, for anxiety. You can use these lasers on horses, cats, dogs, people. So check out Erconia Lasers if you're a vet or vet tech or just a human that cares a lot about pets. Check out an Erconia Laser. And we'd like to thank our title sponsor, Yoga Fit Training Systems Worldwide, the leader in yoga, mind, body, fitness education for over 26 years, educating individuals and teachers around the world how to take better care of their physical and mental health, how to work on your energy with Ayurveda. We've got meditation programs, 200 hour, 300 hour, 500 hour registered yoga teacher training programs, as well as a 900 hour yoga therapy program. So if you're looking for anything yoga, if you've got back pain, if you've got a weak core, if you want better posture, check out yogafit.com. We've got conferences, we've got online trainings, we've got in-person events and so much more. So yogafit.com, you can save 15% at checkout by using the code Make America Healthy or M A H. And again, you can find me at bethshaw.com. I'm on Instagram at Beth Shaw Health. And my books are on Amazon. I'd love to hear from you. If you enjoyed this show and know someone who's grieving, please share it with your friends. Thank you both to our fabulous, fabulous return guests. Namaste, everybody. Have a joyful day.